Hi, this is Vicky Ambalskurt, Professor of Medicine from Baylor College of Medicine and Senior Associate Editor from Circulation. As part of our Circulation COVID-19 updates from the Frontline interview series, today we're joined by Dr. Gabriel Steg, Professor of Cardiology from University of Paris and Senior Associate Editor for Circulation. Gabriel, you're in a very unique position as a leader, as a researcher, as an editor, and as a frontline cardiologist. Tell us about your experience from the front lines in, in France, in Paris. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my experience with the circulation readership and viewership. Uh, France is, um, has been on the front lines and we've been on the front lines in greater Paris uh, over the past four weeks now. We're in our four, fourth week of lockdown. And as everybody knows, this is quite sudden. Uh, you go from a nearly normal life to within a few days, uh, a complete halt to every medical activity or near halt of every medical activity, except dealing with COVID patients. And then you have this uh, wave that climbs and climbs and climbs of COVID admissions and ICU admissions. And you're starting to worry about whether you're gonna have enough resources and beds to cope and then you increase your bed size and ICU size by 50%, by 100%, by 150%. And then we ended up, uh, uh, we started off with 2,000 ICU beds in Greater Paris. We ended up at close to 6,000. So I think there's one lesson here, which is for those areas that have not yet been affected, you have to prepare in advance for a huge wave of COVID patients with all of the issues that are related to this, both the cardiovascular complications of COVID for cardiologists, as well as COVID occurring in our cardiac patients, which is the flip side of the coin. And the third aspect is non-COVID cardiac patients who continue to experience issues, but are too scared to even seek help and then come late. And we've seen, I think, as has been reported in other areas of the world, a relative increase in cardiac arrests and severe presentations of cardiogenic shock for myocardial infarction and maybe a somewhat of a decline in STEMI conventional presentations. So that is also something that people have to, uh, to be uh, aware of. Um, in my cardiology department, we um, three weeks ago, we decided to open a COVID, IC, a COVID CCU and a COVID ward. So now half of cardiology is COVID. I think the COVID CCU is a great idea to address uh, all of the cardiovascular issues I uh, alluded to in COVID patients. And it, 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 we found that this was actually quite a relief to our infectious disease colleagues who had to deal with all of the cardiovascular complexities of some of these patients. But on the, on the flip side, as cardiologists, we also had to care for COVID patients and we learned a lot and we had to learn uh, on the spot, on the job, um, infectious diseases, pulmonology, intensive care, respiratory care. Um, and so again, the, the buzzword word is prepare. If you're lucky enough not to have been hit yet, prepare in advance for that. The third aspect is contamination. Uh, we opened a, COVID, a couple of COVID wards three weeks ago. And within nine days, 14 of us got contaminated, including myself, and I was lucky enough to have a very mild form. Uh, we are not really sure of how this happened. Um, we were quite concerned ourselves with contamination, so we took all the possible steps we thought we should take. Uh, but, you know, like everything in medicine, donning and doffing PPE is technical. You learn it. And the more you do it, the more you rehearse it, the better you do it. And that brings us to, again, the need for preparation. If you're lucky enough to have some time ahead of you, really prepare for that because it's, you're, you can't learn it on the spot. You can't afford to learn it, on the, learn it on the spot. Thank you for sharing your personal experience. As a COVID-19 patient and as a scientist, as a leader, as a section leader, what went through your mind as you were you know, going through the diagnosis? 
on your personal journey? Well, um, I have to tell you, I was concerned. I was very concerned because uh, you rapidly get to see some of the most severe forms of disease. And while 80%, 85% of patients get away without even needing to go to the hospital, we all know that 5% or, or so end up in the ICU and uh, there's substantial mortality, even in younger patients. Um, I'm 61, so uh, I was in the age range where the odds were favorable, but uh, not uh, 100%. And so I was really lucky to have a mild form and so far so good. And uh, you know, I hope everything's gonna be fine. Uh, it's a stark reminder of uh, what's related to our duties as physicians, uh, and this is true for all healthcare professionals, including uh, people who uh, uh, take care of cleaning the hospitals, including uh, people who are in charge of uh, safety, including secretaries. Everybody who's dealing with um, uh, taking care of patients and, and patients uh, is exposed on the front lines, and uh, we owe it to everybody to have all of the protective equipment and gear and all of the proper training we can. And in many places, we didn't have enough time to, to prepare. And again, again, that brings me back to my motto that, you know, if you're not in an affected area yet, absolutely prepare. You must have thought a lot about research during these times, um, both being a leader and an innovator and a scientist. What recommendations do you have while we're in the midst of this uh, big crisis for funding agencies, regulatory agencies, and for researchers like ourselves. Yeah, so this is interesting because it turns out I was um, nominated to co-chair a committee in charge of COVID research at my institution, which is actually a network of 39 hospitals, all of Greater Paris hospitals, academic hospitals, are affiliated to my institution. And so within a few days and nights, literally we tried to uh, draft a plan for coordinating research on COVID in all areas. Um, certainly not only cardiovascular, all of COVID research. And um, uh, what we decided is that we could not afford to delay research for later. As we know, we don't have a, a curative treatment for COVID. We only have palliative treatment so far. So we can't delay finding a cure for later. We have to look for it as, uh, as long as we care for patients at the same time. So we have to be scientists, uh, researchers, and clinicians uh, at, at the, the exact same time. We decided to um, prioritize three areas. Uh, co cohorts is number one. We wanna get cohorts of patients and get as much clinical data, uh, uh, reliable granular data as we could create biobanks, and everybody, I think, readily understands the, the value of biobanks in, in COVID patients. And third were, of course, um, treatment trials. And so there are many other areas that one can find important that, and that are covered in our research program, but these are the three areas which we prioritized over anything else. The other thing is we had uh, conversations with the regulators, the healthcare authorities, and the IRBs, and they all agreed, actually they agreed even be before we asked to set up fast track procedures. And therefore we've been able to review in the committee more than 180 research proposals. We prioritized uh, 79, we started 37. We've all, we're already enrolling patients in several randomized trials and many cohorts. And we've had studies that, were, that went from being written to being approved in 12 days and enrolling the first patient in 14 days. Uh, so we can get through the whole uh, shebang of approval in, in 48 hours. And IRBs meet on weekends. IRBs will meet on Easter Monday uh, and review uh, studies and protocols. And I think that this is what is needed for this extraordinary uh, thing that we're experiencing, you know, literally a once in a lifetime experience. And certainly I hope it's a once in a lifetime experience. Of finding a of, of fighting a pandemic and needing to find the cure as long as at the same time as we are treating patients, um, as we all know, research is also collaborative. It's international. It's a worldwide process. Uh, there's a lot. You you must have heard of the controversy around hydroxychloroquine and 
uh, the desire of some to use this agent based on anecdotal reports, observational studies, uncontrolled trials. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the ethics of randomized clinical trials. It's funny to see uh, the uh, um, um, morning shows uh, on TV discussing the ethics of randomized control trials, but this is what's happening in this country. Uh, I very, very strongly feel that uh, the rigorous evaluation of therapies via RCTs is the most ethical thing that we can do to get quickly to a cure, and that anything that delays this, however a good quality an observational study may be, actually is delaying our, find, our finding a cure and therefore is an obstruction uh, in finding treatments. And I think a good and quick RCT is so much more valuable than the anecdotal experience, even if the anecdotal observational experience is about a thousand patients. This is meaningless. And this is a very practical debate we're having in France. As you know, there's a lot of political discussion about therapies for COVID. Uh, people are taking sides on social media, uh, TV show personalities, uh, politicians, it's, it's very odd. Uh, but I think as scientists, we need to stick to our guns and get those RCTs done as quickly as possible. I cannot agree with you more, Gabriel. And with this, I would like to thank you first for sharing your personal story and also your perspective, experience and recommendations. And I also would like to take this opportunity to thank all our healthcare workers who are fighting in the front lines in these very, very challenging times. Thank you. Thank you.